these sites around here in Menifee where the villages were, where the Native Americans were, and we're going to experience and feel and do the things they would have done. You're going to understand their culture thoroughly, and then we'll use the things that you're making to dress up the museum. And so that's the way we did it. And I just want to say how appreciative we are, Paul, for encouraging us not to just stick things on the wall, but to understand why, and so that we can interpret and create that awareness for our visitors when we're um, serving these doses. So with that, um, I want to just make a couple of quick announcements. we got some neat stuff going on in the community. Uh, we're placing these uh, historical monuments. There's 12 of them that have been created uh, in key places where the old schoolhouses were and uh, mines and, and um, the early pioneer families and where their settlements and all that were. And so I'm um, just excited to have those out there. These are going to outlast all of us. And um, these are the kinds of things that the Historical Association is working on. We're also developing a couple of field trips for some of the kids from the schools, Chester Morrison School. Third graders are going to be coming to the museum in waves of 40 or 50 kids at a time. And so we're going to be having them make uh, corn husk dolls and lots and lots of things like that. So um, I'm just so eager to learn. And um, I know Chris Rick was here. He's a teacher. At, Freedom Crest School, he knows the excitement and the passion that the kids have when you start to talk about gold mines and you talk about Native Americans and things like that. And so they're excited, we're excited, and we're just happy to be uh, woven this into is a the special, community. As this as is a special schools. presentation so about Menifee. Ready? It's so exciting. <laughs> Today Paul's going to teach us about the mines that were in this area. Um, the city's namesake, Luther Menifee Wilson, he named his mine after his middle name his mining district, and there was, those of you who have been tromping around in the hills and stuff around here, you might have noticed tailings and some old wooden timber and things like that. There are lots of mines, um, especially Cottonwood Hills area and all of that. Uh, I just met a gentleman, Brett, who's sitting in the back. He was a miner, he's been underground, he knows this area as well. So um, the reason I'm mentioning Brett is because there may be some of you folks that are here as well who uh, know a lot of, about Native American, not Native American, about mining and all of that. So at the end, we're going to have questions and answers. We want to welcome all of you folks to just kind of chime in and help us learn and help everybody learn about what took place here in the 1800s when uh, the original miners came to this place. So with that, Paul left. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Paul J. Cross. Boys, we're still setting up, and I didn't bring half of what was there. And I just found my pointer, so a lot's going to get easier. Good morning! Are we happy? Yes. All right. Okay, this is a test and exam. How many know what the expression searching for the elephant is? Pardon? Yes, yes. The 49ers and even before then had this term like a pipe speak or bust. And they would paint it on their wagons or what have you. And if anybody asked them, well, what are you doing here out in the West? This isn't even a state yet. The thing that they'd say is, I'm searching for the elephant. And the elephant meant what? Gold. Gold. Um, who's going to operate this thing? Steve? No, I, I, I'm all over the floor, Pat. I see a lot of uh, faces that have been out in the hills with me kicked around. Pat uh, used to be a, a battalion captain in Marietta, and he's kicked rock with me for a lot of years, and we've enjoyed it a lot. Right, Pat? Better say yes. He actually saved my life once when I was uh, going under for uh, sunstroke. And also this lovely leader, we've gone out and shot rattlesnakes together, and we've had a lot of success doing that, right? And the other one, I uh, used to, this lady, um, she used to be my neighbor when we lived up on the hill after we sold our family ranch. So enough of who I am, I'm just, uh, just a guy, a normal that likes this stuff. Today is an awful big charge in the respect that we're going to try to take um, 
of your interest in gold mining from prospecting, which is one science using certain materials, which is the first step in going out and seeking any kind of gold, to the discovery and the processing of a tunnel. It's sometimes referred to also as a shaft. Totally different types of methods of recovering the gold. And then at that same time, we're going to bring in a little bit of the processing of the gold, the methodology involved, and how they would record it, uh, the districts of the, uh, what we would call mining districts that are sectioned off and all planned out by the Bureau of Land Management. We'll have to answer a lot of questions as to how the technology reached various points. And hopefully I won't bore you, okay? Um, and then there are going to be items as I uh, go through and find them and discover them. I'm going to pass it on out to you guys. So just pass them around. Kathy, uh, my wife, hold up your hand, hon. That's my boss. <laughs> and she's a wonderful companion, too. Anyway, she's going to return them back up here on the shelf. And Judy will help. And that's Bill Zimmerman's wife. So hopefully it will be fun and we'll get a chance to see everything. The uh, tub of mercury, where did it go? Oh good, good. I got a number for it. <laughs> okay, let's get started here with my... Can we put up that first one, Steve? Gold. How long do you think in North and South America and Central America uh, we've been searching for gold? Anybody want to take a stab at it? 1800, 1700, 1400? 1000 years. Well you guys are right. If you start going back in the Mesopotamian Valley and in Egypt, they were working with gold way back then. So easily you can take it back 3,000 years with no sweat whatsoever. Every culture has utilized gold for something. It has the properties of always been shiny, bright, clear, and easy malleable into whatever image they want. It's so valuable that the cultures that actually use gold learn that it's better to actually use sheets of gold and lay it over either a ceramic or a clay piece or a wood piece rather than using the whole solid piece of clay. Now when the Spanish started their exploring and came into South America, that would have been oh, 1528, they started looking for gold. That was their main reason. One, come over here and get gold and reach the coffers, enrich the coffers of Spain. Second, convert all the Indians that you possibly can to Christianity. And when they are Christians, they become citizens of Spain and there's nobody objecting as to why this is Spanish country and it doesn't belong to the French or somebody else. That was the politics involved. Now this, this is an example of what I'm talking about. Where's that pointer? The big button. The big button, he said. All right, here we go. Uh, this is a, a mass that was found in uh, Inca culture in Peru. But you can see this is just a thin sheet of gold that was hammered out, shaped, and then pressed over a wood mass. Now the Spanish, they were only after the gold, nothing as far as the culture or anything. They would peel off the uh, gold, the layer of gold, roll it up in a ball, and then later on it would be smeltered down and would go back uh, to Spain. Um, you can see this is lovely shaped and the realism. These are probably tattoos on this particular piece. These pieces up here probably held a mass and were the tie backs. Next one, Steve. This is two pictures. Looks like there's one. This is the actual um, mountain as you find it today. But in the northern part of uh, Brazil, the Spanish found a very rich culture where gold was very plentiful and they made a lot of effigies and such. 
they would take those effigies and once a year throw them into this lake. And it was a very deep lake, a volcanic uh, core actually, and uh, they would just toss them in. Well, the Spanish in their explorations and looking for gold found out about it. So they felt the best way to do it, because we don't have divers or anything like that, is drain the lake. And what they did, using Indian labor, they started, this is an early print, you can see they put a V-notch canyon in it. They went all the way down and drained the lake, pretty much down to a level where they could pick up the artifacts and go from there. That was in 1528. And then the Indians started talking to them about El Dorado and the seven cities of gold. So the whole thing became a big gold race. Never mind converting the Indians, they can become pack mules and slaves for us. Let's go find the gold and then we can report back to Spain that we're doing our job, receive various honors and all that sort of stuff. So actually, the California gold rush, of course, we'll say is, uh, what, 1849. Well, 200 years before that, there were Caucasians from Europe fighting South America, Central America, and on into California and into Central uh, America looking for gold. Very, very old. And they found a lot of gold, too, and they learned how to process. Please. Now, as, you, as I mentioned, this is the Indians, as you can see, their garb, their costume is really, this is actually overdressed. Normally the men don't wear any clothes and the women just wore a tulip grass skirt. And this Indian is actually allowing a child to be baptized by one of the friars. Next one, please. And the Spanish immediately started putting the uh, prisoners and other Indians to work. The first thing that's involved in any of this work is if you found any kind of indication of gold, you start cracking the rocks. Cracking them, cracking them, pounding them into their just a dust. And that would take an enormous amount of time because the rock that usually uh, is the um, a platina or the uh, fine rock bearing um, gold surface is usually quartz. And how hard is quartz? Some of you that can remember the geology classes. Want to take a stab? It's probably the second hardest mineral in the world. And their job as Indians was to crush that and grind it. Okay, next one, please. Okay, this is a, a willowing method. I'm trying to get a little bit of uh, a foundation built as how they process and got the gold out. And this is referred to as dry washing. And what they have is a hide here, usually of a, a doe or a gentle uh, creature that was young, so the hide wasn't uh, tough. They would beat it, clean it all up, pound on it until it got to be uh, shamming, actually is the closest comparison. After they did all the grinding of the rock and got it to a point where it is just the dust, they still had to get the gold out of the dust. So they would put it in this particular chamois, and two men would stand opposite of each other, and they would toss it, just like your willowing wheat or something like that. The dust would blow off, the heavier gold would seep down to the bottom. Next one, please. And another way, rather than just using the Indians, and I swear that, uh, Pat knows what I'm talking about. The large uh, mortar that was found in the bedrock up in Cold Canyon, which is now Copper Canyon, is one of these. And what it basically is, is a large boulder, a matati-shaped hole here. Uh, one man would shovel in uh, bits of the gold. This man would pound it down and down and down, with the object again being get it down to a powder, which is basically necessary. Next one for any kind of smelting. And uh, who knows what this is? Sutter's Mill. Mill. Great, great. Sutter, uh, of course, this is a hundred, almost 150 years later. Sutter built a sawmill 
I could get into history about them, but that's not necessary. One of his workers, the foreman, reached down in the uh, flume that came down here to power his uh, uh, will and saw something sparkling and said, geez, this looks like gold. And he took it to Sutter. Sutter put it on the top of a fence post, <clears throat> started pounding it, and it started to work out almost like it would with a sheet. Um, he uh, said, this sure looks like gold, and they tested it again and again, and they said, this is gold. And he told his foreman, don't let this get off. Keep it to ourselves. We've got a corner here. They might really be a claim here. What happened? Foreman let it out. And here came the gold rush. And Sutter could not stop it. And that was the prelude to the 49ers. Next one, please. And like I said, there's the elephant, and there's the prospector looking. This is something, he, an aberration probably that he's seen. He's dropping his pick and everything. Next one, please. This is uh, Trujillo. Uh, he used to live over in Meadowbrook area. He has quite a history in Western Riverside County. They say that he's the founder of the Good Hope Gold Mine. I, I lived less than um, oh, two miles from the Good Hope Mine, and my father, uh, when it was not occupied and the stand mill had all closed up, was actually in charge of taking care of it, and eventually, he covered the mine entrance, the main mine with bulldozers. And um, he's holding supposedly a piece of uh, uh, gold ore. Now you can see that uh, it's whitish material, so it would be uh, probably in a quartz. Now mind you, it could be in quartz uh, such as this. By the way, it's dirty. It came right from my garden, so apologize right now before you start handling it. Okay, there you go. Just pass it around. Feel the density of it. Try to scratch it with your fingernail using the Lord's hardness uh, scalp. And um, not all gold though or gold bearing rock is gold bearing quartz. This particular piece is chalcedony, which how, what are they used for cal uh, Sydney calcite? Sheep rock. And there's a large quarry of this up in uh, Colton. They actually level a mountain uh, going for this stuff. But to look at it and feel the weight, you'd swear it was milky quartz, gold bearing material. There you go. And now I'm going to wait. No, you should show them this. Now you can start to see a little bit of the shimmering here. Uh, you can see that, how it's shimmered back and forth. Well, the rock is called um, Fieldspar. This is the rock that if you were to look up uh, mountains, you'll see kind of a line of rocks running up the side. It's almost mechanical in the respect they're just a straight line. Well, that's referred to as a dike, and it's not the female variety, okay? And anyway, the dikes have field spar, and field spar has a, a domestic use. It's actually ground up, and it becomes what type of an abrader? Used in the kitchen, all of you have used it. Dutch cleanser. Actually, where they were quarrying this rock back east, the foreman noticed that all the uh, shovels that the men used were brightly polished. And then he looked at the properties of this and said, well, geez, we might have an abrasive here that's softer than pumice, which is like comet. And they could create a Dutch cleanser. Anyway, that's not a spider bear, is it? <laughs> it anyway, the other stuff, if you'll notice, the silver item, uh, they'll see a lot of sparkling silver. And if I get over here, I can maybe get it to shimmer a little bit. See how that will shimmer? Well, that's beautiful. It's rock. But it's mica, biotype mica. Now, mica has an interesting property in the respect that you can take a sheet off and please pick all you want on this, okay? Um, and you can peel it off in a sheet that you can hold up to the sun and you'll see right through it. And how many of you remember the 
posters that we used to have with the sides that would drop down, and inside was a kind of a silver component. Well, that silver component was mica, okay? And mica also has it in its properties, it does not burn. And they could cut it down so small they could use it for window lenses. And I'm going to pass this around. But this is really the big floor because you can look up at the mountains with those dikes running down. And if the sun is right, you can actually see the mic is sparkling. And the first thing you think, oh, silver. No, it's not. Now, I saved the best for the last. We probably don't have any lights here. Maybe we should turn on some lights, uh, Bill, just for the heck of this. What I'm passing around to you, this came actually from the Good Hope up higher on the ridge going towards, um, oh, geez, I want to say Arm Mountain, but that's not correct. But you can see there's a lot of uh, mineral uh, rust deposit on the surface, and then you can plainly see the uh, quartz, and then you'll start to see some very fine flakes. Well, that might mean a lot in respect that you can see, as I hold this up, you can see the sparkling of gold in there. Uh, it's really great. Now, try to get the gold out of there and leave the matrix rock and uh, try to recover at least maybe 50% of it. That was always the challenge, was the recovery of what you find, okay? Lots of times, earlier miners could see the sparkle, but no way that they could recover without it being high grade, okay? We're going to start this one with this side. Okay, don't try stealing the gold, okay? <laughs> this, I know we've all seen this in all various parts and things, and they sell it, and they say it's gold, and yada yada, and all that stuff that goes with it. Actually, it's a very low-grade gold in oil, and I wouldn't doubt if the oil is not olive oil, and the uh, it's from sheets of uh, gold leaf. And they just peel it off or scrape it off and put it in a vial like this and say, this is gold. And they're absolutely correct, but it is so low as far as the quality of it, you couldn't even make a decent ring out of it. But if you look at it, you can see the quality of what we mean by uh, gold leaf and the uh, finer gold. So back to, uh, let's flip it and get away from uh, our friend there. This is an Arasta, and on our ranch we actually have one of these. Arasta, probably in Minifee area, I know off the top of my head, probably at least where maybe 10 were located. At one mine, they were three, and Arasta was uh, an early uh, stamp mill. What you would have is the pole structure, one across, and with lines leading up to where the burl's at, then you notice you have the circle around here, and that would usually be a rock bed, and you see this, this is a drag stone attached to a chain. They would dump the ore in there, and usually they'll select the highest grade ore, and then get the mule going, and he would go around and around, this is his trail there, all day long grinding up the ore. I've heard stories that they also forced the Indians to do the grinding too, but I have no proof of anything like that. But those were the Erastas. The reason there's no more, and you don't find a lot of them on the hills, is people would go in looking for gold. Everybody's looking for that elephant. And they would tear up the bottom rocks looking for any gold that, that might have sifted down, and they would pan for that. Uh, right now, the best examples of an Arasta is at the Ramona Pole. They have one there, and it's in place. It was actually used at one time. And then the other one that I think is really fine is at the San Bernardino County Museum. I was with Dr. Gerald Smith when we dug up the one, and it came from Homeland, of all places. And uh, next one, please. Now, this is still Mexican uh, technology. Anybody want to take a stab at this mine? Come on, just shout it out. I know you all know it. You're just being bashful. It's the good hope. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, the Good Hope, it, it has a long, uh, great history to it, but of all the lines in the area, this one you should know more than any. Where, where is it located? Well, uh, you see right here, this, by the way, is the actual uh, map of the area. And hey, look at that. Uh, anyway, uh, right here is Highway 74. And halfway between Elsinore, which is here, and up here in Paris, uh, which is about five miles from Elsinore, is the Good Hope Mine. And as you're traveling towards Paris, it's on the left side. Why I think it's so important, as you're traveling down that road, at that point where that mine in the old stand mill used to be, is four miles of tunnel. Four miles. And thousands of cars pass by it and on top of it daily. And they were stacked up. They had elevators and everything in it. And they had a, uh, that was it an eight stamp mill? I, I think it was an eight stamp mill. We'll get into stamp mills after a while. But remember the whole thing, the whole logic of recovering gold is to crush it, crush it, crush it. So they, this large structure here is where they had their stamp mill. And this area over here, this tram, actually is where the ore carts, which we've all seen full of ore, came up from the ground, came up, was dumped in an ore cart, then pushed around, and it went inside this upper level. It fell into chutes, and from there, it would filter down into where the um, uh, crushers were. Now, the crushers, uh, depended on what type, they had two different types uh, in that mine, but they would actually crush up the ore, and they would do this pounding noise. They could hear, when this was operating, they could hear the noise of the mills pounding all the way into him. And that was 24 hours a day. And that's what the men also heard too. And they could feel the uh, actual pounding deep down in the ground. It was actually five layers, strata layers. And what you see here is what they refer to as tailings. Now, paintings, when you are out crawling around and you see this pile of dirt, that is normally a tailing from a tunnel, okay? And it's usually stuff that they've already processed and is of no value. But if you notice the difference between these two? Okay, this would be fresh tailings. This over here is stuff that's already been stamped. Now, stamping, when it was stamped, it would release itself into what they call skirts. And if you were to go into the good old mine, oh, about twice the length of this room is these tables at an angle, and it was mixed with water. Anybody want to take a stab at what else? Mercury, absolutely. And the mercury is like, um, just like this. I put it in a large uh, cylinder like this so you can play with it and not worry about getting any on you. But um, this would be mixed with water. Now it's not soluble in water or anything like that, it would just kind of float. But as it came down from the stamp, it would mix with this water and then deposit on the skirt. And the skirt would pick up the gold and the water in the motion would go down and be recovered and reprocessed again. And it would leave a slurry, and the slurry is normally white, that color there, okay? So at the Good Hope, if you look at one side of the road, you'll see where you'll see processed earth, and on the, um, well, there's some other mines of it too. Now this actually processed all of the Minifee gold mines was the uh, process by the mill at Good Hope. I said that correctly. Right. There's a lot of stories we'll try to get into about the Good Hope, but uh, that's for later. But uh, the Good Hope is here. It was in what they call the Pinacotti Mining District. Who knows what Pinacotti means? Stinkbug. Stink so there you are, a mine named Stinkbug. I wonder what it smelled like down below. But anyway, that was uh, their area. 
This is the Menifee Mining District. And these districts were put together by the Bureau of Land Management. We'll back up for a moment and we'll give a little story of what took place um, when they were establishing these. Now California had just became a state that was belonging to the United States and they had control of it. And here came these miners. Actually, they came up the immigrant trail and they would nose around and look for any gold. They're prospectors. And they started to discover, uh, thank you dear, <laughs> they started to discover various types of uh, gold deposits scattered around in different types of material. So one guy would run out and he'd put a stake in this corner, that corner, that corner, that corner, and say, I've staked it, it's mine. And some mine would come by and say, well, wait a moment, how do you know that's yours? It belongs to the state, it's mine. So all this conflict would wind up in Sacramento and people would be fighting, there'd be murders, lynchings, and everything. So the government said, well, we've got to get ahead of these miners. We got to send out our own surveyors. They got to survey it, section it off into what they call sections. And if you ever look at a section map, you'll see California and you'll see longitudinal latitude uh, lines, and these are little squares, and they'd all have a number on them. Well, your mine might wind up in section 25, and that's in the Pinacati Mining District. But by so doing that, and the miner racing in and following the claim, there's no more disputing back and forth. It wasn't like that way when the 49ers came in looking for their elephant, because they would just be panning. They would have their pen, and they, they actually had trousers where they could stick this pan. Wherever they went, they carried their pan. They would eat in it, they'd wash in it, and they'd do some other things in it too. But anyway, this was their pan. And when they go to a stream and they're actually finding, looking, prospecting, prospecting at this level for gold, they would stick the pan in, scoop up some slabs, slurry it around, and the harder and heavier gold would sit to the bottom. The other items that's lighter would go over the edge. But there were no stake in the claim. All the miners knew that, hey, that's Skinny John's uh, mining claim over there, and that's Peter's over there, and that's Long Tom's. You don't go over there and stick your pen in there, you'll get shot. And they did get shot, in the respect that fly likes me, huh? Uh, because there were no rules controlling anything. Gosh, she likes me a lot. But even if they found nug nuggets, <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. But they would have to turn around and crush them up, okay? But that's free gold in respect that the gold sample has already disappeared. Now, where's it at? <laughs> the, the gold sample I sent um, around to you guys is actually in a matrix, matrix, okay? And that's the host rock that contains the gold. Now, the stuff that you take out of the stream bed is free gold or free floating gold or powder gold. And it's quite ready in respect that once you, um, oh, you hate these mics. Once you get the, uh, can you hear me back there? Yes. 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 Once you get the um, gold out and washed out all the matrix rock, just the creek gravel, well, they would take a deer horn or a buffalo horn, or even a steer horn that's been polished, and they would scoop out the actual gold. And then they would take it, allow it to dry, then dump it into what they call a poke bag. And the poke bag is a long skinny bag like this, and it was designed so that the orifice or the mouth of the bag would fit around the horn. And they would put it in there, shake it up, tighten the knot again, stick it on the inside of their pants and allow the upper part to hang out. And that was their poke bag. And if they went into town to buy something, and by the way, the people that really made the money was never the miners. <coughs> it was the people that sold them their supplies. Bacon, bread, butter, that's where the money was really at. So, they would go in, and 
they would be, and this is a little bit more elaborate than maybe the other one. But uh, you open the drawer, pull out your weights, set it here, and then uh, release this part and put their gold there. And they were obviously after a certain type of weight. And once they found the, the weight where the key off and actually be level, then, and they had a way of carrying off the scale, so it um, was taken into consideration. Well, the man paid for it. And sometimes it would be just a pinch. Like for a loafer bed, it would be a pinch, which back in those days could have been the equivalent of about $12. So this would be a pinch, and he would put it in his book bag, okay? But the whole economy of California during that period was based on a gold standard. They did not submit in San Francisco, wasn't even doing anything, but they were catching up, and or was uh, presented. Thanks, Bill. And um, these were very, very valuable. This one came from uh, Calico. If you notice this side here is all burnt. Well, a real problem with most of uh, the old, early uh, mining towns was fire. Because the only thing they had for heat was fire, light, fire, cooking, fire, and things would catch on fire. And at uh, Calico, they had the fire. This corner was burnt, and the pieces that went inside supposedly fused together. I wasn't able to get that, but it's a dandy piece with a lot of memories. And I would never try to change this patina. But the miners had their own little uh, scale, which was uh, in a little uh, box. You open up the box, you take out the scale, you screw it into a base, set the arms in it, and they only had a little small section, and they would use that for daily use. But trust me, the ones who made the money was the purveyors who paid for various things. And by the way, the little scale, this little gold scale would sell for about $800. Now back then, that was a fortune, but that's what they actually had. There are all kinds of stories I'd love to tell you about, um, oh, the guys watering, ordering for their uh, gold. I mean, I'll only share one with you, and it was the where this guy would go into, it was at the Lazy Susan's mine in Nevada. And the miner would go into town for their entertainment, playing billiards, singing, dancing with other miners, and you go to the bartender, you want a beer or a whiskey. So he would take his pinch and then practice made perfect. And he would put it in his book bag, but he would always spill a little bit. And that spill, he would brush like this. Well, actually what he was doing was brushing it through the cracks in the wood. And then later on in the evening, he would send in his own guys, usually the Chinese that were to do labor or some Mexican labor, and they would pan what had fallen through. That's just one of the cons, and I could go on and on about it. Even the girls that worked the saloons had their cons for getting more gold out. Okay, um, pardon me while I take a slug of water. Um, the, the mercury, we all know mercury is highly poisonous and it destroys brain cells and will actually create vacuum holes inside the brain. And it's, it's a shame. I uh, read an article several years ago, maybe 15 years ago, in National Geographic, and a miner had died in Alban in Spain, and they sliced his brain, and they're just these big boys, look like cheese, or so many holes in it. And he was a career mercury miner. Can you hear me? <laughs> there we go. I'm not sharp on technology, you guys. <laughs> I really am not. Anyway, the mercury. In San Jose, uh, of course, the Spanish went in there with their mission, and they were doing their thing, also looking for gold and semi-precious minerals or whatever the case might be. 
Well, up there they have what they call the uh, Costa Nolan Indians, very poor people, and they were converted, a lot of them, to Christianity. And in came this one Indian into the mission, and his body was painted red, and he had a high fever and was delirious. So the Padres didn't know what to do. They did uh, uh, pray over him and such, but there was this one officer that was, of course, a Spanish soldier, and he looked at the guy and he dragged his fingers across his uh, cheek and felt in his hands and asked how long and looked at his throat and such and says uh, to the other Indians that had brought him in, take me to where you get the red paint. So they took him out to an area south of where Silicon Valley is now, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains to this spot and all of the rocks were as red as your shirt and your jacket, sir. Very bright red. And he said, okay, we're cleansing this off, and this now belongs to Spain. And in Spain is the world's largest mercury mine. It's called Almaden mine. Well, this particular mine became the new Almaden. And they started mining from the center bar and processing that into the mercury. Now it's interesting, they say that as they would pick into the center bar, it would start, and this is their expression, crying mercury. It would just run out. So it was very, very uh, rich. And they started to ship it all over for the various usage by the other soldiers that were prospecting. And uh, the other part of it, it's so interesting, this little thing here, they actually mined more mercury and dollar uh, was higher than the amount of gold they took out of all of the Sierras. This right here. And they all said you'd not have any gold if it wasn't for the mercury that came on out. It's very toxic, by the way, and if you were to cook it, fumes would come off that would probably kill you and it would evaporate. This is the stuff that if you were to put this in the refrigerator, what would happen? It would freeze solid. You could pick it up and it actually is like a stone. Of course, gradually it'll start melting again. Interesting properties about it. And if you had a dime or even a piece of uh, uh, real gold, the mercury would just surround it like that. And that's what they want. Because once they did the gravel and they had just the, the gravel like this and it was mixed with the gold, they still had to get the gold separate from the matrix. And this was their ticket. This little solution right here. Next one, Steve. Please. Okay, this is some of the miners on the outside. By the way, uh, the good old area, all the way down to Meadowbrook, uh, was miner shacks. And they actually put together their own um, old slums, uh, they, were, they were just tents and lap boards, but they had the Irish camp, the uh, Cornish people's camp, uh, the Mexican camp, and it was actually like going into a different state. Next one, please. I don't know, I counted how many people here is here, but um, uh, I believe when I counted, I came up with at least 30 something. And there's the miners all on the trestle part. This is that tram that swings around to um, where the stamp mill is actually at. And you can see how they dress. And this is an ore cart here. Notice how the tracks go right down to the flat of the ground. Well, actually, that's the mouth with the tunnel that went down even further to the different shafts. Now, they controlled, if they were going to send this down, at the end of each shaft is a bell. And if the cart was traveling down, it would be one strong strike, saying we've got in the chute a mining cart going. If it was to stop at maybe the third level, well, they would ring the bell three times. I'm not doing it right because it wasn't three, it actually was four. Okay, but they ring the bell, and everybody knew that it was going to be stopping there. And then when they wanted to go back up, they would hit the bell twice, 
and then the winch would pull it back on up. So that all depended on that line thing. If there's a cave in, they just took the bell and just started clanking as much as they possibly can, and everybody would come running and wait for the ore cart to come up. If it did not come up, they started climbing down to whatever level that the collapse uh, tunnel was at. Next one, Steve. This is the boys on the exterior, and if you can look, take a look, you'll see it. Well, it's pretty hard to see it, but these are short handled picks, where the pick uh, is a lot shorter even than this. Now, this was found at an entrance of the pick, of, of the pick? Okay. Of the, okay. <laughs> of the mine. You didn't want a long one because you're working in an area that was no more than this. And that was your main shaft. If you were picking along and picking and picking and picking, and all of a sudden you found a little tiny, maybe a quarter of an inch gold in, in quartz running along, well then you would start following that. And that's a drift, meaning it's drifting along. And rather than digging a big tunnel like that, they would send in a skinny guy, really a skinny guy that would lay on his belly and peck and peck and peck and follow that vein as it meandered around uh, the soil and the rock until it opened up. If it didn't open up, they abandoned it. The whole process is why invest a big tunnel to chase a small vein? Now, I have several stories about guys that were trapped chasing that thing, but I'll save that for maybe later on if I have the time. But this is the exterior, and what's nice about it, we have the names of some of the men. And some of them actually helped found the uh, school that was there, a church, and they actually made it into community. But it always, all my life, it was a shanty town. Next one, Steve. And it had to be like that, because once the gold petered out, they grabbed everything that they could carry or put on a mule, and they went to the next strike. This is what the uh, bird's eye view. Now, in the back over here is the Gatlin Hills. This is the various camps, with this one here being the assayer's office. We'll talk briefly about that, and this here is the actual mine. And uh, an assayer's office is built, suppose they found some color in this. Well, they would go to the assayer, and he would say, okay, let me take a look at it, and he'd measure on his scale how many ounces he's working with. And he might come up with something like about 10 ounces he's going to process. And then he process, processed, he would crush it up like this, then he would turn around, put it in a small crucible, it's a ceramic crucible, and then they would have a metal tray that it would set on and they would put it in a, a little small furnace and it would melt. And that was the first step and then he would do it again until he got all the purities out of it that he could possibly do. And then he would weigh it again and that would tell him how much and eventually he would multiply it on out to maybe you've got uh, a ton. A ton of rock will give me, oh, a whopping five ounces. And that was a pain in mind. It's it's not easy. It's things of big amounts of gold. No, it was very very poor. Um, next one, Steve. This is the school. It's burnt down now. That was right across on a river road. You can see the boys even have uh, bicycles. The girls look all nice, wearing nice long dresses and such slowly becoming uh, civilized. This school was actually put together in 1910. Next one, Steve. So you can see that the whole area was first settled by miners, Menifee included, in the respect that first it was the gold miners that came in, or the silver miners, or the clay miners, and they established their tunnels, got it painted and such. When it petered out, they started into dry farming. But first was the gold or the, um, the miners. Okay, this is the, a cross section of the tunnels. It's a little bit hard to see, but up here is the sand mill. 
This is ground level here going across, and this is the main shaft. You can see how it drops down to one level, uh, two level, three level, four level, five level, six levels. And uh, if you were to add up the distance of all of those, you've got four miles. Can you imagine losing a miner in there? He's lost, or maybe he had a wall collapse on him, and you, with just crude instruments for life, had to go look for him. Be terrible, I think. And, by the way, your light, should we get into this? I think we should, because it's enjoyable, at least for me. <laughs> could I, could I uh, get you to break this candle, sir? Just snap it in two and get down to the, not pull it apart, or the, Oh, that's interesting. There's no thread in this candle. It's at all. Oh, there they are. Well, try not to put your muscle. Let's see. Whoa. Uh, let's see. Made in China. <laughs> try to get with this one, please. Yeah. Did it work? Okay. Now I can go on with my story. Here we go. This is referred to as a sticking Tommy. And you can pull it out like this, and you can see, yes, you could stick somebody with that. And it's just one shape of a rod art with a little hook on it and a place for your candle to go. And they would go with this, put her back up. They would take their candle, like the one that we just now and they would be given two candles. Now we're referring to the miners that's about to go on ship. And the miner would have the two, they're all equal in size. He would snap it just like this, and he would take and snap the other uh, candle until he had a little small section like this, which is actually half of that uh, controlled piece. Then when he went into the mine, he would light the candle and he'd carry it like so. Or he'd carry it with the other piece. He didn't hang it on his hat or anything. He came to the wall and he would pound with his hands or tapped it into the <laughs> surface. And he would take the candle that was broken and he would hang it just like that. And that was all the light that he had. And mind you, this only gave a, oh, the candlelight might be about this large. And you're looking, you're looking for specks of gold. You can see how difficult it is. Now, when this candle burned out, he would pull it out, take the next one piece, just tuck it in there. He would continue to work. And then in the afternoon, after he had his lunch, he would put this remaining piece in here. When it started to get down to where this little orifice is here that holds the candle in, his ship was over with. And he would walk down and wait for the other miners to come up from the lift of the tunnel, and then they'd ride an ore cart back up to the surface. And there they would actually be policed and looked at real carefully and make sure they were not doing what? Yeah. High grading, right, stealing ore. Now, um, it's very, it's a universal thing for the miners to all have this system. And that method did not get replaced until they started bringing in oil lamps. And this is an example of the oil lamp. The wick is down in, in the back part of here. But this had a very large loop on it. Now you'd think, well, maybe they hung it on their hat. No, this was actually for the mules. They would put it onto the harness, and the mule could see. The mules did not like going to any place where it was totally dark. So they gave a little bit of light, and this was oil. This could have been any numerous types, even turpentine, burning inside of here. I'll pass it along. But the miners would also carry them on their belt, but they didn't like them because it's, as they're digging in one spot, the fumes from this would really get it congested. And they didn't have any kind of mask. What they had was their hanky. They would tie it over the nose and that was it. Didn't do any good really whatsoever. Later on, they came up with this little baby. And there was a place in, in 
Minnesota that decided, well, heck, we'll put that oil into this little lamp or kerosene. We'll have our own little glass flume. We'll have a little wick in there, and we'll put a reflector on the other side so we can, and this is a zinc plate, so a miner could actually hook it onto their hat. You can see the little parts in the back to grab a hold of some, or they could wedge it into the rock. And this they considered was genius. It provided so much more light. It, uh, and there are all kind of varieties, as you can see with this one here. This is used a little bit more by the railroad, but it had a great uh, flat bottom, and it wouldn't tilt over as easy. Now, if you were to look and find the original one, this would be red. And without, because of the children here, you know what the red part was for. Anyway, miners would go into town for their own amusement. They'd go to a section of town, and the miners would take, leave their light burning, set it on the bench, and go in and do their business. And that became the red light district. Okay, just from this. And um, later, later on, oh, I sure most things up. They developed uh, this particular piece. Bill, while I get a drink of water, explain to him how this worked, please. Stand up, sir. This is uh, our vice president of Minifee Museum and Historical Society. He's going to explain the chemical uh, rationale as to how this works. Please, well, you have the floor. I'm certainly no expert, but I can tell you that uh, miners used carbide, and carbide was something that all you needed to do was add a little bit of water to it, and it would actually light up and, and be uh, volatile for uh, lamps and stuff. So carbide lamps, I would say about 20 years, maybe, was kind of the use of carbide lamps, maybe even 30 years. Yeah, yeah. so the water would be readily available on the ground anywhere you want. So I like to use carbide because those older rocks, you put the carbide in the lower chamber and the water in the upper chamber. You dial the dial on top and tell you how much water went through onto the carbonite. It would make a heightened gas on the lens, there's a striker on there. You would take your hand and go to the top of it, that all the gas on one side of it, and you move your hand across the striker, striking the gas on fire, creating the light. He's exactly right. And um, let me show you what the striker is. Right here, can you see the spark? Okay, of course, this is a light reflectancy, and this is the way. Yes, sir. With these, oh, oh my gosh, that's the first explorers that came in, the mountain men per se, uh, the one that got uh, in prison in San Diego uh, by the Presidio guards and stuff, uh, that was what, about 18, I would say 11 in there, they were also looking for gold. So uh, you have that. Now, if you think the Indians, the Indians in the area, the Luceno, the Cahuilla, whatever you're looking at, none of them understood or even had a name for gold. It was of no use to them. Let me pass this and take a look. They developed, as this went a little along, a little bit further, uh, this system. You notice how it's attached to the back? and they could walk on through, but it still offered no protection as far as rock or rubble falling on top of them. Here you can pass it around as you can see it. Now those were really good, but they had one problem. If there were any kind of gas that had seeped in from them going into a particular mineral and it accumulating, poof! <laughs> you've got problems. So they were not safe. And in England, who had the same problems in their coal mines, they decided, let's go to what is called a safety lamp. Now this is designed so that it could fall on the floor, uh, gas can't get into it, and it was a safety lamp. It was first introduced in the United States in the coal mines. But we borrowed an awful lot from the coal mining and their industry and the technology they had. The first unions for miners came out of the coal mines. Here you go. And um, this is actually uh, oh, 
some of the ore for the lamps. And, oh, this canteen, uh, they said it's Civil War. I still have a hard time uh, accepting it as Civil War. But it would carry water. It's never for drinking. It was designed to go into their carbon rocks. Nothing more, okay? And, and I think it's kind of neat because they even carry these in battle. Notice as I pass around the strapping method here. And the other parts of, uh, well, eventually, of course, they got into the battery system. This is a large battery here. You got a place in the back to hook it onto your back, onto your uh, belt. And this part here would come up their back and attached to their hat. And there would be a certain amount of charge that they would have here. I keep going. The other is it developed onto other lights. Okay, oh, I was, uh, sticking Tommy. I don't know why they, uh, so many things that were Celtic, and it's also the word Tommy. And uh, sticking Tommy, I've heard miners who wanted to kind of impress me or whatever, tell me it was because it was the first weapon they had. They couldn't carry knives or guns down into the shafts, but they had their sticking Tommy in case they got into a disagreement with somebody, they could stick them, okay? But uh, it, they're quite an unusual, and you find them in different types of shapes, and they could go as high as $200 for the real rare specials. I'm gonna pass it around. The repos are The man is absolutely correct. The repos are, uh, they were actually making them in Taiwan. Because it's actually just one rod of um, a square, uh, rod. square rod, and then they heat it and start bending it, and they create the loop and the whole thing there. Okay, uh, go ahead, Steve. Sorry, I'm neglecting you, man. Sorry. <laughs> this doesn't look like much, but at the Orange County Railroad Museum, just south of Paris, where the actual city of Pinacotti was at before they named it Paris after the surveyor, this was the assayer's office for the Pinacotti Mining District. It's still there, you can go and take a look at it. It's a beautiful structure, the way they got the stone and such. All the other buildings are gone. This is the oldest building in Paris, or at the Pinacotti. And you can see how small it is, and it's actually down about two feet into the ground. Why did they do that? Very simple. It was almost like a cold cell, a cellar. Okay, next one, Steve. Yeah. This is the uh, uh, front door. It's all hand hewed, and it's back and board. You can see them running up and down. Next one. Okay, this is um, this is a crude method of uh, prospecting. Now he's got his uh, dust in his pan, mixed with his gold. Now the gold weighs more than any of the dust in his pan. So he sets down on his butt and he blows on it. He swirls it around and, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was actually a process for processing the gold. Eventually, after he's winded and probably passed out from lack of oxygen, he would have gold in his tray. Next one. Yeah, this is a rocker. You notice how his hand is on this arm right here? And the other, he's actually pouring. This man's coming in. Notice what he's carrying there. What is that? It's an ox yoke. Same as this one right here. Steve, can you get up and we'll use you as a dibble? No, he wasn't with the 49ers. He came later. Now, this side is water and sand and that actually had ore in it. Then he's carrying it back from the street. You can see the little hook here. And uh, he brings it in. What do we do with the clicker? Uh, oh, there it is. He brings it over to the guy, and this guy 
dips with his little dipper out the ore in the sand, puts it in this rocker cradle, which has a grid on top, and he rocks it back and forth. The water in the slurry filters down into another grid, and eventually down here, and it's caught by these little lines that run across where gold dust is, and the water runs out here. And then he would take his little uh, horn and scrape out the remaining gold. That was one of the first technical methods of actually mining for gold. Honey, what do you think of this? Where did this idea come from? Ox cart and another one? Chinese do it all the time. And who gave it to? The Swiss. The Swiss used this and they took the idea from China when they were stealing how to make blue work. Okay, thanks, Steve. What was the price of gold back in those days? Oh, jeez. I think it was something like 20 cents an ounce. It was nothing. Not like a thousand something today. Not at all. Okay, next one. And of course, that all depended on what they would come in from San Francisco. San Francisco would have runners, or the butterfly would go through and come back and tell the miners. Uh, it's so much dollars or so many cents per ounce. And time they went back, it had gone up again. There are reports that the miners would actually hoard their gold or a, a new ledge in, in the mine until they found out the highest rate that they could possibly get. Then they announced it and sold it. Okay, this is, um, this is at the Santa Rosa mine. And you can just start to see a shadow here, and then the upper walls, and then it just kind of drops down. And I stumbled upon it looking for the Santa Rosa mine, but this is the biggest tunnel I was able to find. And the Santa Rosa mine is right up here in relationship to the good old. Eventually, they had a wagon train uh, that would take the ore down to good old to be processed and ground. And eventually, they got so profitable, they did put in their old um, uh, stamp mill. Next one. This is very common. You can see the buckets there. It's full of ore. He lowers it down to where the poverty's are actually working. They dump it out, and that's that's the system. It's actually working for a tunnel. Next one. You know, the uh, Santa Rosas is in this uh, spur of mountains over here, and uh, they would send a wagon train with an ox team, would come down this dirt road, twist around, and this is their first place where they water their ox before traveling on down to the Good Hope in the stand mill there. Next one, please. Boy, I can't see anything in that. Can you guys? But uh, each one of these, uh, uh, and this is a map I got from the Bureau of Land Management, but you can see, I think they've got the long, uh, the Leon uh, mine, each place where there's a pickaxe and a shovel, it's a mine as such, but not necessarily a gold mine. Next one, please. Now, this is the good hope when I was a boy, back during the 50s. You can see all the sides are pretty much ripped apart. This had corrugated uh, steel on it. The corrugated went to roof some of the old barns and things around and some of the pig lots. This is an estuary here. And there's not much left to it. Next one. And that's me uh, right there. And uh, that's the line. I mean, nothing. Next one, please. Now this is the tailings. All of this, well, let's say this is the flat ground. All of this mound like that runs for over a block is tailings, or that's been processed. Now they did come up some guys during the 50s, and they said, well, what we'll do is we'll bulldoze into this, take it over and reprocess it, and use modern technology to recover what gold they can. They still couldn't make it work or pay you. So they turn off, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that to you. And um, they couldn't make it bigger, so they abandoned that process. Again, please, oh, this is 74? Yeah. Next one. But uh, it's 
a long story. I'm going to condense it a little bit. What stopped that very profitable Good Hope mine was, anybody want to guess? Well, the audience were fighting about that. But water. The mine hit a water table as such. It flooded each one of those shafts that had taken over 50, 60 years to dig. Okay? The miners all basically said, we can't mine any deeper, we can't chase any of the drifts, so we're abandoning it. And people lost money. It fell into bankruptcy several times, and it was really rough times. So, Bud Hook, who was a prominent citizen, who knew even Minifee, uh, and he had a dealership, a car dealership in Paris, he stepped in with a guy named Mates and another fellow, and said, there's water right there, guys. Let's pump that water out, and we could sell the water. And the guy said, well, wait a moment. The first crop should be our crop, and what does the area need? And they took a look at the area, and they said, well, it's all sagebrush. The railroad's coming through. We need wood for cross ties and sleeper ties, and we also need support timbers for the mine. So they said, well, let's grow the fastest tree we can find for those timbers. And what they did, like the gentleman said, they went to eucalyptus from South America and Australia, red from eucalyptus. And if you were to drive up Highway 74 and you look at some of these older eucalyptus trees, you'll see that they're in rolls. And they're only less than, I would say, a half of a block to the mine. Well, they grew. <laughs> But then the wash of this strange phenomenon started happening. When they cut the trees down and they looked at the wood inside, they saw that the wood had um, big, long voids inside of it. And the, but the wood grows straight and fast. So they started talking to some experts, some I imagine even at UCR, and the expert says, well, those trees are from Australia and work into their genetic factor. The sun goes across, but it's way below what line? The meridian that circumvents the earth. And so by following the light, it would twist a certain way, never cracking on the interior. But we brought it above that line, and when the tree followed the light, it went a different direction producing the cracks inside the tree. Again, the whole project was abandoned. They didn't sell them or anything like that. They stopped pumping the water out. And the only thing left now is the eucalyptus trees. And that was the golden, um, the golden eucalyptus enterprise, I believe is the name of the firm. Okay, Steve. This is more tailings. Again, there. Go ahead, Steve. This is the wash. This is Steel Peak, or Steely Peak. And in this wash, uh, you can find objects, or relics and stuff that had washed down. But right here, use this tree for a marker. This is the road, and the tunnel used to sit right here, the main tunnel. Next one, Steve. You can see the, uh, the amount of tailings this is looking back over towards Canyon Lake and uh, the uh, uh, Salt Creek. Next one. More tailings. Get those in your mind in case you're wondering around what a tailing actually looked like. More tailings, the same picture. We'll have to talk to our technician. <laughs> this is, I, with my camera, I was just walking up the wash and this is stuff that had actually washed down. You can see a square nail there. You can see part of a, looks like maybe a horseshoe, a washer, and some of the other things. This is left over from the mining camps. Now, mind you, that's probably been picked over, would you say, Pat, at least 75 years to 100 years? You don't find much more than that. Go ahead. Okay, that's again the eucalyptus tree. Uh, shooting on it was probably one planted by hooks. Next one. 
what am I getting into botany right now? <laughs> Next one, Steve. Okay, this is very exciting. Bill and Judy and Kathy, and we had, uh, who was the other gentleman? Rick. Rick. Where's Rick? Hi, Rick. You shaved. <laughs> anyway, we're, uh, I showed him where the Lucky Strike mine was, which is right off of Highway 74. And this is the creek that runs right by it, and under uh, Highway 74. And right there, I want you to notice this box sitting in those uh, uh, brambles. Could you give me another one, Steve? Click it, Steve. Oh, there you go. Okay, you can see just it's a long box, a long trough item. Looks abandoned. Next one. Okay, we've opened up the lid. You can see the grid in here, and I believe there's a special type of cloth here to get um, the gold. And what it was is basically a trough all designed to accumulate dust, gold dust. And they would pour water into it. The water would run down from the upper end down and run out the bottom. And then the gold dust would actually accumulate in the texture and in the pattern. Then they would roll up this piece and then pan it out using a gold dust uh, pan. But to find something like that is very, very rare. This over here is at Elsinore. It's near Central Avenue. Over on the other side of the road, freeway there is where they uh, have that new quarry. This is all clay. And the miners that eventually, they saw the gold was petering out and they couldn't make a living for themselves. Well, they started searching for other minerals. And the gold miners actually discovered this clay deposit here, very rich clay deposit. And they set together their own kill. First it was a lime kill. And then they started working with the red clay. And it held together real well. And that was their first bricks produced in the area. And they started selling the bricks to the railroad, which needed it for all sorts of purposes. And they also found, and if you'll notice, this is a, a, like a seam line. Well, that's a strata formation. This is, rather than being anything that might be an igneous, or a metamorphic. This is uh, sedimentary. And they found, anybody want to guess? What ore would you possibly find there? A very rare, no gypsum. one even blinked it. Pardon? Gypsum? Well, gypsum they did find a, a little bit down further towards Corona. They found coal. Now, coal in California, in, in Riverside <coughs> County, no way. They found enough coal that they started selling it. Guess where to? The good old gold mine. And it was the railroad. But they sold it to the gold mine as they went into the steam type of stamp mill. And it actually kept them busy. And then at one time, this little valley here employed 45 miners digging coal. And it was great because a lot of the guys that couldn't find work back east and were disappointed with the lifestyle and everything after the Civil War came out to California and they were Cornish coal miners. So they just fell right into it. Within 20 years, it petered out. The story of any kind of a miner. Now, if you go to this place and you look over here, right in this embankment, used to be a tunnel, and you could crawl on your belly into the tunnel when I was a boy. You had a big room like this, and on one wall, it was some numbers, and it mentions con um, and a year, and it was where a convict actually lived. And they had an old metal uh, spring bed there, and all this stuff, and some other brick of racks and some old uh, cans. But now they've gone in and they caved it in. I wish that could, could be exposed again. I'd love to go back into it. Next one, Steve. This is closer to the area. Right in here is where the line went. Notice the sedimentary rock. Next one. This is a Grandorite. Grandorite portal of boulders are found all over the area of Minifee. This is actually in Minifee. Doesn't look like anything, does it? 
This is the only indication I had when I went out there that there was a mine there. And you can't hardly see it with the picture and angle, but right here were some ground squirrel holes. And I started digging one ground squirrel, uh, squirrel hole, and I went down five feet. And I realized it was dirt that had caved in, and that's the tunnel entrance. But if you look at it, there's no indication that there's a mine there. And Bill and I was once talking about how you stumble into these mines. And I read the report from BLM, and they said that in the Minifee area, there are over 300 mines, or exploratory digging. Next one, is now, This is the road leading back to where that particular mine was at. But if you notice something else about this area, notice these are very nice, fine-grained uh, granite boulders, which lends itself to what? <coughs> The other usage of the miners stumbled in for their talents. Quarry and rock. Okay, next one, Steve. Okay, this is an example back in the Cavan Hills. That's my son and another uh, kid, but this is the size of one of those boulders. Pat and I went out there looking for it. We couldn't find it. Pat Jennings said, oh, this has actually been packed and shaped like that into a post form. Well, they had their own quarry operation. This is at the uh, uh, MacDougall's quarry. And they would go in there, shake these all up, haul them in by railroad. And they would ship them all the way into Los Angeles after they had them stacked out here in the field. And Los Angeles would ship them on up to San Francisco. And if you're ever in San Francisco and you're downtown Mason Street or one of those or Broadway, you look at the curve corner, you'll see how it's curved, and it's out of native rock from here, from that source. And another big quarry was right, uh, let's see, it'd be east of here, where they quarried the rock. Now it's all constructed, constructed with homes. And those rocks also went there, but they also went to Riverside for what structure it's so famous. The courthouse. Who said that? Let's give him some credit. Courthouse. And also to Stanford, up on the peninsula in San Francisco. All the stone that came from right here. Next one. Okay, it's another. Here you can see the actual drill mark coming down here. And that's done with one of these. This is solid still, a little harder on the bottom. And usually those could unscrew. This was held. A man twisted it, another man used the, um, oh. I'm running out of hand, Steve. <laughs> Take the hammer, the hammer, the hammer, right there, okay. No, I, remember, I'm flesh and blood. Okay, here we go. This is held on the boulder, and he would hit, go ahead. Okay, he tapped it. And then the guy that was holding it would twist it. And then he would hit it again. And that was his job all day long. And so they didn't get stiff. Now and then they would change positions. By the way, these were also used um, in the mines. And they would take them down, pack them with dynamite, with a fuse, and then have an explosion. And that's where the expression came, fire in the hole. Next one, Steve. This baby, it's a sweet little mine, but I never was comfortable in it. I remember crawling back into it, and you had to crawl on your belly because of all this wash that had gone in there. And I didn't see very well, and I'm crawling on my belly, getting all kind of dirt packed into my dirt system. And uh, I didn't want to go any further because I was worried that if something should happen, I would get in trouble and I would find myself. Well, lo and behold, all of a sudden I hear this oh, no. And the first thing I said, rattlesnakes. Mm. And all of a sudden, on the top of my head, going down my back, was these bats oh. flying out. And I tell you, I, if I could use the expression, I almost peed my pants. I was so scared, just terrified, with that actually happening to me. 
and I had to scoot back. I raised up and I hit the ceiling. I went back, back down and I about hit the floor. I eventually got out of there, but I, was, I couldn't catch my wind. I was going, <laughs> and I could not see one bat. I don't know where they went, but I was in that bat. And from that, from that point on, I've known that it's a bat cage. <laughs> Probably the reason it's still there is no one's foolish enough to go into it. Next one, Steve. Okay, it's hard to imagine, but if you take a good look, and this is near Winchester, there's your mountaintop, work on down, there's your tailings. And this is an old magnesium mine. And that thing used to employ, I understand, over 30 Chinese, and they would tunnel this whole mountain. And you can see the tellings everywhere. We've been wanting to go up there someday, right, Pat, Bill? Okay, next one. Here's the same tailings. And obviously, uh, the tunnel would have been against the mountain. I don't think they had a stamp mill, but this sure looks like it's processed earth. Next one. And with that much dirt, you can imagine how deep the tunnel actually is. Next one, Steve. Now this looks like, uh, obviously, this is alluvial fan. That's dirt that's washed off the mountains. But if you look at the way this mountain's been carved, all of this is dirt that's been removed. And then you start looking for the tunnels, and the, most of the tunnels have all been sealed up. On the other side of this is what lake? Diamond Lake, right. Next one, Steve. This is closer to uh, where I live, over in Canyon Lake. And they refer to it as a cut. And obviously the crown here went across to the other side, but exposed probably in here someplace, was a vein that looked promising for as gold, and they started working it. And because of the sharp angle and the pitch of the roof of the crown of the uh, mountaintop or this hill, they decided to take it down all the way and they cut it like this rather than having a tunnel. This helped them with looking for drifts of gold and other uh, ores. And obviously this in front is the tailings. And look how it's grown over with sage. It takes a sharp eye to see the tailings. You usually just find it by stumbling into it. Next one. Uh, this is the um, mine right. Um, there's many fee. And this is good hope. Right in here is Holland Road. And this is near Holland Road and the State of Brothers Market that's off of um, Pearl Valley Road. Do you know the name of it, Bill? No. But it, uh, if you stand by uh, Staters and you look up at the hills behind State of Brothers Market, you'll see the tailings. And this is a grid to keep people from going into the mine, and you can see another grid over here. Notice the rock. That particular rock is Oh, it's been confiscated. Okay, here you go. It's this baby here. Notice the coloring. And again, this is feldspar. But along with feldspar, they are a lot of quartz associated to it. So they probably found gold in the quartz. Next one, please. You can see how deep the tunnel goes down. Right in here, in the grids. This wouldn't stop anybody that's ambitious enough to go in there, but it's at least a little bit of a profundity. Next one. Now, I may get my parents. Um, limestone, he's absolutely right. Uh, what, you can't hear? Oh, okay. The, uh, this is. Um, Pat, I took Pat down here. This is Marietta Road, it's right across here. And this is limestone. It gives a little pockets of very white uh, limestone up further. And the limestone was used and they burnt it in the lime kilns, which they're scattered all over this whole valley. Next one, Steve. Gunther. I found it. Anybody can tell me one thing about Gunther? <coughs> Created the Hot Springs Resort? Exactly. 
And guess what he was? A miner. And what did they use that uh, uh, hot springs for originally? Bathing. Bathing, of course. But they brought the sheep down, remember? Marietta did, from way up north in the Sacramento Valley. And when he got down here, they would obviously shave off the wool. The wool stunk, it was dirty, it was filthy. It took hot water to wash it clean. They went to the springs and they washed it. And that was its first purpose. They were so dirty, the springs, nobody would bathe them during the period when they actually did the sheep shearing. Next one, please. Doesn't look like a miner, does he? This is Fritz uh, Gunther's house, typical lap board. That's in Marietta. Next one, Steve. This is the hot springs. Next one. I should probably get packed um, while I get a drink of water. Are you interested in telling about this one, Pat Jennings? Your family is very much associated with this. By the way, I'll give you the location. This is in Marietta. It's a very deep, deep um, mine where they went after. Go ahead. Silica. Silica. Who has any questions about silica? So we are running out of battery, so we're going to go ahead and sign off now. Thank you for joining us. This has been the Menifee Historical Association. Thank you for joining us. You have five minutes.